Hi, I'm Sam Sells, and welcome to my podcast, Clean Money. I like to say investing matters, and my show is to talk with everyday folks that are not only creating great success, but making an impact in society and improving the lives of others. That is my mission, and I want to share my stories and others with you. Welcome to Clean Money. Thank you again for joining today's episode of Clean Money, where we like to talk with our guests about how they're having an impact in the world and making a difference in people's lives. One of the things I've been most passionate about is just how we view the world, how we see through our own eyes. And my guest today is Amy Cook, who is the founder and financial advisor at Maven Lane Financial Group. Amy's career spans over 20 years in financial services, transitioning to financial advising in 2009. She's the author of the Amazon bestseller, Your Money Narrative, which delves into how personal experiences shape financial behaviors and decisions, which is exactly what I care so much about. As Amy worked on her own money narrative, she helped her clients do the same with a mission to build lasting legacies through effective financial decision-making and strategies. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sam. I'm excited to be here and talk with you today. Yeah, awesome. So it's so good to have you. I, you know, I, I coach, I teach, um, you know, folks getting into commercial real estate, learning how to raise money, learning how to do deals. And the number one issue that I see face them is not their ability to go do projects. They can learn about it. They can learn the the procedures, the activities they need to do. It's their mindset. It's their narrative. It's the things that they've been telling themselves for the past 20 years or 30 years or 50 years or 60 years. And you know, that's what keeps them held back from going and doing the things that they need to do. Um, so tell me, you know, you've, you're now an expert at the money narrative. You spent a lot of time with your clients staring, looking at their minds, how they think about things. Is this an issue? Am I just blowing this out of proportion or, or how do you see this? Uh, I mean, it is an issue. I mean, and we all are wired differently and we all kind of come into the picture with our own set of stories or narratives. Um, and that's really what it's about is figuring out what they are. In order to figure out what they are, we have to be aware that they exist. And that's what I think is so key. If you can kind of pull the cover off a little and and look inside and say, hey, that doesn't make sense. Why am I so afraid of talking to Sam about investing? Why am I so afraid of real estate? Why am I so afraid of whatever part of financial planning it might be? It usually ties back to something. And, and it's just a story that we that we sort of bring into ourselves and our being and, and, and the way we sort of go about the world. And we're repeating it and we don't even know we're doing it. But sometimes it can really sabotage what we really want. So how did you find out that your uh, mindset or your money narrative needed to be changed? When did that happen? And, and walk me through that a little bit. That's a great question. So prior to being an advisor, I've been an advisor for 15 years. I was in the mortgage business. Um, I noticed that the work I was doing and the people, my clients that I was working with, everything felt very reactive, you know? Oh, I've got all this credit card debt. I need to refinance, pay it off. And then six months later, a year later, to be back in the same spot. So clearly it wasn't just this one-off, you know, thing that happened and, and this unlucky situation. There, there were habits there. And so I noted, I felt like I was working very reactively. And I really wanted to move over to the proactive side. And in doing that, I was looking at myself, uh, you know, because I was kind of work, I was a work, work, work kind of person, just work around the clock because I had this fear of, of losing everything and just, you know, packing it up and everything goes away, disappears a day. So I would just continue going, going, going. And I started looking at like, this doesn't make sense because 
the numbers change, the circumstances change, everything's okay, but yet I still have this like nagging thing that that I can't seem to escape. And so I started just working on my own personal development and I and I started tying things back, you know, and and say, okay, that makes sense. Cause when I was little, when I was seven, my my parents lost our our house and super scary stuff as a little kid because you see all this stuff going on and and mm. you know you don't really tie the pieces together so it seems like one day you're in the you know this great house and the next day you, you have nothing and so in my mind it all rooted to money so if there's more money then it solved all the problems and obviously money does solve some problems but all I clung on to was that one piece so therefore you got to focus on making sure you got that money uh, what it was really about was as a little girl was, you know, I didn't like seeing my dad so stressed out. I didn't like the the chaos and it was the security. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't the, the money. It was it was what what went along with it in my mind. So and it's it's never done. I mean, I'm still I mean, you, you don't just arrive and go, well, you know, I figured out my story. I figured out a lot of my stories and sometimes that will happen and I'll go, what the he heck, you know, uh, what, yeah. what, why yeah. am I thinking, or why is my mind going back to that? And it, it's, it's a process. It's a process. Absolutely. So you're, you're working with clients. You see that they're just making bad financial decisions. Um, and like all humans, we tend to blame our circumstances as if they came upon us all of a sudden and we didn't create them for ourselves. Um, you know, I think, I think a lot about this all the time. I talk a lot about this with my wife, you know, what are our self-limiting beliefs? What's keeping us from becoming the type of people we need to become. I grew up poor. I remember taking some of my youngest memories were taking a bath in a horse trough that my dad had put up on blocks and had a fire underneath there. We were living in rural Oklahoma um, and he would go get water in a big tank and drive it over to our house. And, you know, that was our water it came out of this water tank. I don't even know where he got it from. And then he'd pour that into the, you know, horse trough and that's where we took our bath. So, you know, that life and perpetually always, even as my dad finally got a job, I remember when I was 12, he started making 30 grand a year and we thought we had hit like the big money, you know, because we could get new clothes. Uh, but subsequently, you know, not paying for insurance for the car, sister wrecking it, you know, all of a sudden now we got this bill and we can't use the car and they're paying it out of pocket. And, it, you know, like all these things, these decisions that they made because they had no idea what to do with money and because they looked at it like poor people look at money and so i grew up being taught you know money is a thing you use to buy stuff and when you someday you make enough money that you have credit and then you can use the credit to buy stuff um and that's what we did you know but that's not how you become wealthy that's a great story and uh you know, so I, I think a lot of people can can relate to it because, you know, if you think about it, our, the only thing we have to go off of when, as we're growing up and we become adults is what we've been taught. And if all of our stories are kind of based on, you know, what our parents are going through or close family members and they're not great, then of course you're going to avoid the topic you know, and of course you're not going to want to be there. Or you're going to want to do something differently, but you don't know how. Uh, similarly, like outside of the house, like there were ebbs and flows in my house too, where it was like, if, you know, the receivable, because my dad was a small business owner, if, if the receivables came in, everything was good. And, yeah. and I, and I did his billing from the time I was 12 years old. And so I was like, did you get the mail? Did you get the mail? Did you check it? Because because I knew, you know, that that meant that that everything was okay, but it was like so short term, and so it would just sort of happen, and then and then it'd be great, and then not, and and there's just this absolute. I mean, you could see how the fear forms around things like that, right? And and so yeah. it's hard to change that and say, 
what if I want more than that? What if I want to build something and, and, and some households, you know, that's, some, that's kind of looked down upon, like, like you're, you're asking for more than you should have, or you're being greedy or, you know, there's a, there's a lot of different narratives that can go along with uh, building wealth and, you know, be doing the right things with the, with the money that you build. And, and those are all valid, but they're all just sort of different sets of rules and we all form them in different ways. It's crazy, right? It's crazy that we all do this. We don't talk about it. Why don't we talk about this more? I don't know. You know, I think about that all the time. I, I there's such a, like a, like a shame element, embarrassment around money. And it can be on either side of the spectrum. If you think about it, I mean, we all know people who just kind of seem to have it pretty good, you know, kind of born into just having it pretty good. And then that carries its own responsibilities. Uh, you know, even if you can't relate to it, you can empathize and go, yeah, you know, because the bar is just set so high from the start. I mean, it's almost kind of like yeah. if you grew up with the whole line, I mean, Bar is pretty, I mean, it's pretty, you know, it's not as hard to become a superstar, right? If, you know, uh, depending on, on where you start, but people can be afraid of finances, even if they have so much money, there's no way they would ever spend it. And I, I've worked with a lot of people like that, where, you know, they'll have that, you know, that microwave from like, you know, 1950 and, oh, it just keeps, you know, breaking in the washer. And it's like, you could, I mean, you could line your house in, in microwaves right now and you'd be fine, but that's, you know, it, it's, it, yeah. it's all where they're coming from to, you know, that, and, and for the most part, what I've noticed is it largely the, 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 the biggest fear is, is running out. Scarcity, right? Like that scarcity brain. It's the, it's like the animal in us that, is afraid and we run away. And if I spend this money on this thing, I'm going to run away. I was talking just before uh, this podcast, Amy, with a, a friend of mine, she's a developer. She's developed a lot of stuff. She grew up in a home of developer, developers, but very humble beginnings. Um, and, you know, created herself into becoming a, a uh, developer and, you know, life changed quite a bit. Uh, now she's uh, single again and drives around a $150,000 car and has another $50,000 car. And we were talking and I said, you know, hey, if we're going to do this project, we're probably going to need to go raise $10 million and fund this project. And she said, well, how do I do that? And she's made, she's got millions of dollars in personal real estate. She's made millions and millions of dollars. She's got plenty of money. But I said, well, hey, you know, just go talk to some of your wealthy friends and business partners and see if they'd want to join us on this project. And she said, well, how do I do that? I don't talk about money with them. <laughs> so you're hanging out with your wealthy friends and you're not talking about money. You, and it's just this thing, like this American culture that we think it's okay to talk about you know, what you did the, over the weekend, but you can't talk about your money. You can't talk about how you're growing. You can't talk about those things. Those are all taboo. Um, but why? Like, why is it? Why can't we just talk about money? I agree. I mean, people talk to me about money uh, every day. So I'm just so used to talking about money, but out and about, um, yeah, it's it's very taboo. It's so uncomfortable for so many people. And I mean, sometimes I'll get on calls with someone I've never talked to before and I'm asking basic questions because I need to know, like I need to understand what's going on. And I can, and there's this hesitation of, well, roughly, uh, or roughly around here, or roughly around that. I'm like, just give me the numbers. I don't care. I mean, I'm just I I, I whatever they are, they are. Yeah, no judgment. I yeah, just, I, I just I, my my brain's just building, you know, the whole the whole sort of macro view, and but and I so sometimes I forget, you know, and, I, and then I then I see it, and it's like okay, there's there's a hesitation, and 
And we were also taught some of these things like, you don't, don't, you don't, don't run around talking about what you make or, or bragging. I mean, it could be whatever the story is, you know, that, that there's this sort of cloud around uh, opening up or oversharing, uh, making someone else uh, uncomfortable or making them feel, you know, insecure on the other side, if you say something, but I mean, obviously there's always a balance with anything in life. I mean, you don't want to run around with your tax return and, you know, lay it out over, over, you know, a cocktail or whatever, but sure, I do think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of struggles that are widely accepted. And this is one of the ones that is just not. It's just not like, it's, it's interesting. And I think, you know, part of me, it, it, I, I will say this. So when we started making money finally, um, and, you know, we started owning more and more commercial real estate and we started growing and becoming bigger and bigger, um, you know, you do kind of paint a little bit of a picture or not a picture, but a, you know, target on yourself out there and because there's plenty of scammers and there's plenty of, you know, um, litigious folks out there who are looking for a payday and, and think they can get easy money from you. Um, and that's, that was, that was something that was unique. It's one of the things that I've learned, but I've also learned that people who create wealth are happy to talk about it mm-hmm. and they're happy to talk about dumb decisions they made where they lost money and they're happy to talk about what they're doing now to improve or to increase or to grow. I mean, and I've just found that when we talk about it, we are far more likely to improve and we're far more likely to listen and learn. So if somebody comes to you, Amy, and you're, and they're willing, if they have hesitancy, they're probably more hesitant to receive your instruction. Um, but if they're open and they're going to listen to you and you're like, Hey, these are some of the things you can do to create wealth for you and your family and a legacy. Um, they're more likely to go do it. The hardest part is probably just picking up the phone and calling you in the first place or sending a message and getting on your calendar. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I think that you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into that too. Uh, hiring people who work with money, there's this kind of self-qualification. Do I have enough to talk to someone who works yeah. with money full time? Uh, are they going to like kind of laugh me out of the room? And I think that part of that is the industry. We've, we've in some ways created that, um, you know, people that work in the industry by overcomplicating it. And and sometimes I feel like it's been overcomplicated almost to justify what we do, if that makes sense. It's like, yeah, it doesn't need to, I mean, it's not that hard. I mean, yes, sometimes there's some habit resets and things that need to change, but there's no reason to make it complicated. Uh, it, it's really a function of having the right team to walk you through where you want to go. And so I look at myself as just part of their financial team. It's not, I mean, I get some, I have some very, very smart clients, you know, that that can can easily do things, but they know that they need someone helping them because this is all I do all day. Commercial real estate is all you do all day and they have something different that they do all day. So just like, we go out and have, you know, CPAs and bookkeepers and, you know, all the people that stay up on top of their little, their sector. I mean, that's just smart and it's, it's yeah. a good use of time. And even as an advisor, I, I will have other advisors look at my plan because I, I, you know, we look at our own stuff sometimes and we, you know, have just, blinders and spots that we don't know are even there. So I think it, even in your own business, it's, it, it's helpful to have someone else take a look at your strategy. Always. Yeah. Always. We've done dozens of syndications and I, in fact, on this call to, uh, 
another quick story from today. We're, we're on this call. I have an institutional partner, the billion dollar firm, multi billion dollar firm. Uh, we're working, we're partnered on a project. Uh, we're working through HUD and the partner representative, he's VP of that company, Harvard grad, all this stuff. He's on there and he's like, all right, we're doing this, this, and this. And I'm like, all right, hold on a second. Um, I'll just call him Harvard for this. Just hold on a second and listen to these other experts talk and then listen and then start asking questions and uh, more detailed questions and and so forth. And we, we figured out that there was a way that, you know, HUD would cover a million dollars of, of X, Y, Z, and that would improve the project. And we would make about three or $4 million more on the project um, that, you know, the Harvard trained multi-billion dollar firm done tons of deals, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I've done dozens of deals too, but you know, I didn't go to Harvard. I went to the military and, you know, served my country and, and then got out and got into commercial real estate. So I, I have a master's in healthcare and nothing about business. So I've learned it from the, the life the school of hard knocks, but I also learned that when we listen to others and change our perspective and get out of our own money narrative. Like he was thinking, this is the way we need to do things so that we can make the most money, but we shifted. And by the end of the call, our strategy completely changed um, to a different one that is far better for us because, you know, we're willing to set aside that money narrative and go with, you know, what is the, let's follow the numbers. Let's, let's figure this out. Let's listen and learn. Um, and we, so it happens to all of us, whether we're Harvard trained and billion dollar firm and blah, 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 or we're young and new, um, we all face these blinders that we set on ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, and I think, I think that's the key though, is that if, if both, if everyone's willing to, you know, kind of brainstorm, if you will, like, Hey, you know, this, what about this? This doesn't mean those are the best scenarios. It's harder, you know, when you're stuck on something and, and it, it can, it often happens with couples in my business where you've got two totally different, uh, beliefs on, mm -hmm. on something. And it doesn't, it's not that one is, is necessarily wrong or right, except that, you know, our own right is right. And, and that's, that's where it's a little bit more challenging because I think for you and I, like thinking about this stuff all the time, like we're, we're going to be open, like, Hey, that's, that's interesting. I, you know, I see where you're coming from. Let's look at that. Let's think about that. That makes sense. And you shift direction. And so it, it with, you know, with investing, with financial planning, that that's what, that's what it is. It's that we're, we're always, we have to be flexible in that, you know, if we could just sit down and, do a financial plan when we were 20 and it was just this life map of perfection. And, yeah. and we're like, oh, fantastic. Or, you know, here we are in line, you know, 32, let's just keep going along. It just doesn't work that way because life yeah. changes, things change. It's dynamic. We have to look at it and go, wow. I mean, for me, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. I, I, I always try to just go, you know, wow, you know, learn from it how, how am I going to do it differently? But as those things build kind of your armor builds too. And, mm. and you, 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 you build, you kind of equip yourself to better deal with things in the future. So it's, it's not like a, I don't really look at it as a mistake. I mean, there are mistakes obviously, but it's, it, it's, it's not the end of the world. Most things are not the end of the world. Yeah. I yeah, whole wholeheartedly agree. We've made some blunders, some mistakes, some, you know, and every single time it's yeah, like you said, it's built our armor, it's made us more savvy, more sophisticated, because we pivoted, we changed immediately. And that speed of change to saying, okay, we did this thing, it did not work. We will not ever do that again, but we're gonna try it this way. Oh, that didn't work either. Let's try it this way. Oh, that didn't oh, this one worked. All right, this is the way we're gonna do it from now on. Um, the, the faster we're able to change and adapt, the faster we grow, um, and we create the velocity momentum and we are able to just push forward and, 
I think we have to give other people that grace too. And we have to give it to ourselves, right? Absolutely. I think that giving it to ourselves is number one, you know, because we tend to be hardest on ourselves. Yeah. And we can, we can look at someone else and go, God, you know, it have, you know, a lot of grace. And then when it's ourselves, it's just like, I mean, I've, I've spent half my life beat myself over, over just, even just by perceived, you know, what, you know, bar that I've imaginary bar that I've set. And, and it's like, you kind of, it's not, it's not the best way to be or to live. And I think that's, that's part of, you know, growing it's as I've, grown, you know, as a person in this business, growing a business and just, you know, the whole picture, raising kids and all of that stuff. Um, I just, you know, got to cut myself some slack, you know, it's just that, that perfection target is it's, it's an impossible one. It's, it's a real trap. Uh, it's a trap. It doesn't exist. Yeah. It doesn't exist. It doesn't. It's like gotta re erase that narrative. Like, cause it's not, it was never there. It was never there to start with. So it's never been there. It's impossible. We can't get there. It That perfection trap keeps so many people from becoming who they could become because they can't launch it perfectly or they can't do the next thing perfectly. It's like the you know, best advice I ever got about podcasts was, Sam, just do it. The first ones are going to suck and nobody's going to listen to them. So be terrible when nobody's listening and get better and get better. And before long, you'll find your voice and you'll do great, but you've got to go out there and do it. And I was like, okay. And so I just did the first five, 10, 20, and they were terrible. And I listened to them again. I'm like, man, my hair was terrible. My, you know, I'm talking about weird stuff. I'm a weird dude, like or whatever, you know. You like, went off on a few too many tangents. Yeah, I chased too many <laughs> squirrels, and you know, that's okay. It's okay. Just learn and grow, and learn and grow. And so, what you know? Tell me about just tell me about your book. Yeah. So the book really, I mean, it sort of evolved. I I always wanted to do something. Um, and I, I've noticed with the clients that I work with, they, they really just, they don't want a stuffy wall street feeling, uh, financial advisory office. Like if you come to my office, you'd see it literally looks like my living room. It just, I just kind of like did the same thing because I just didn't want it to be, you know, off-putting in any way like you don't you don't need to be uncomfortable to talk about your finances yeah and i and i also you know over the years noticed so many people would say oh you thank you so much for making this so easy to understand and for simplifying the process and i'd say well if i didn't do that i wouldn't understand it myself you know i'm like <laughs> explaining it the way it makes sense to me but you know then I started to realize that that's not really the way it works with a lot, a lot of others, you know? And, and so the book is real, it's a, it's a bunch of short stories because you, you pick up a book that's about, you know, giving up the latte and changing your life. But we have so many of those. I mean, there's so many financial books out there, just, you know, millions, right? I mean, I don't even know how many yeah. come out a year. It's just endless. And it's like who, and a lot of people love reading those and that's great. And I spent a good number of years, right? And then you kind of start to go, God, I don't really want to read this right now. The bullets, yeah. the steps. Um, and so I wanted it to be kind of more like a fiction, fiction type of book where everybody likes a story. We all can muster through like a good kid's book. It's a quick read. So I wanted it to be short and I wanted the stories to be short and I wanted them to be relatable and people to where you, you know, I, I don't, I forget how many dozen or so stories in there, but they're all relatable people that you might say, oh, hey, I can relate to that or my neighbor, oh, that reminds me of my neighbor or my friend and pick, you know, a few that you can really connect to, but all of them kind of make sense. And it's really just kind of looking at their dilemma and then 
some ways that they could consider looking at the the situation that they're in. And not all money narratives are bad. I mean, there's really good money narratives. You know, some some people grow up, you know, with just healthy healthy views around money, and they usually marry people that that don't have the same healthy views around. So so there's just whether what you know you're going to deal with other people with different perspectives in life, whatever the topic may be and, and, and financial included. And, and it's just kind of looking at it with a different lens and what their perspective might be. And I, and I think if you can look at some of this stuff and start laughing about it, like that's insane. Like that's crazy. Why, you know, would I be so afraid to do X, Y, or Z it makes no sense. Then you can start to change it. Yeah. That's it. So tell me some of those crazy ideas that people have about money or, or some of them, you know, what do you see a lot of? So I think that there's, I mean, cra it's not really crazy ideas. It's more just uh, things that are sort of halting, like being afraid of investing, being afraid of real estate, being afraid of of risk like so they can be super uh like not just very unlikely so if you think about someone who's so afraid to put a dollar into the market because it's just going to disappear i mean or this or the whole market disappearing that you have to think about what would need to happen for that to happen like every single company in the united states would have to completely bankrupt and i and you know i think we have bigger problems if that happens you know there's there's gonna be some yeah the, the fiat system's gone away nobody has money there are so. other things going on <laughs> that are far scarier than that so it's like just kind of bringing it to like okay here you know this is where risk tolerance comes in this is you know those conversations but avoiding something because of of an irrational that was the word i was an irrational fear that that is not it's just very far off from something that would be likely to happen or feeling like I have to do this. Um, I have to fully fund a, you know, four year uh, college education to a private Ivy league school because that's what my parents did for me. So therefore that is my, that that is my obligation to do that, even though they might be working as like a teacher and there's, you know, that would, financially devastate the household to try to do that. And, and those are, those are hard conversations because, you know, people are are set on some of these, it, it, it's, it's not always something that just, you know, you sit down with an advisor and then they walk out and go, Oh, well, I'm not going to do that. It, it's not that easy. You know, it could be right. over time and planning and, and looking at it and, you know, how about we solve for this? And, I think that's what I love about financial planning is, you know, we start with the goals, like this is what you want. You know, the, this is this is the perfect picture for everyone that's different. And that's why so many financial articles are so challenging because it's like there's these blanket things that just don't apply to every single person in the exact same way. But you start with those, you see if it works. If it doesn't, then it's up to me or you or the, you know, whoever to look at it and say, okay, well, what's the most important? Like, because one of the variables has to change. We either make more money, we earn more on, on our money, or we spend less money. Or we, you know, work longer, make more money. I mean, there's there's only so many things that we could shift to to create the win. And so it's, and again, dynamic, you know, that it keeps changing and ideally we're growing and inching up and, and changing in a good way. But I think just the transparency of seeing it on paper and going, oh, that that one doesn't really work. Like, yeah, I want to retire this year, but you know, I'm 45 and I'm gonna I'm gonna run out of money in the next, you know, five to seven yeah. years if I do that. So I guess I'm gonna go ahead and table that for a few years. It just it 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 gives you a, a you know blueprint roadmap where you're going. Otherwise, we just run around doing things because someone said we should do it. Oh, put yeah. this much money into this. Oh, you better buy some real estate. Oh, you do, and then they, and then you end up with all this stuff, and go, well, what's it really going to do? What's it's? It seems to be doing well, but it, how does it connect to what I really want? Yes, yeah, that's that's great. 
and you you said before that you know so so here you have this plan you're talking to them like this is the thing you can do whether there's more real estate or stocks or whatever it is and your you know overall strategy that they feel comfortable with um they're scared of risk so they're not willing to do anything or but they they know they need to do something they're just can't send the money out of their account into the brokerage account or into the stock account or whatever. Um, so if you, I mean, if you come up with a, a great plan and and they can't get past the, the headspace of, of an, in allowing that money to leave their, their bank account, they can never grow. Or change the strategy. I mean, because a lot of people are, don't have that level of fear around investing in things like that, but there's other risks where it's like, did you know that, you know, hundred percent one thing, it, you know, the, the risk, you know, goes up substantially because of X, Y, and Z. So there's that, there's that too. And, and sometimes, you know, people are aggressive and then they, they stick with that for so long and then they don't ever take a step back and it becomes yeah. a, a point where it's like, do you really need to take on that much risk right now? Maybe not. Yeah, maybe not. And, you know, what do you need? Do you need cash flow or do you need growth? You mm -hmm. know, cash flow <laughs> pays bills. You can't retire if you don't have cash flow. So how, you know, how do you get there? Well, and that you must deal with that every day uh, where yeah. you have investors that don't necessarily need that income right now. So they're willing to bank on future opportunity for when they do. Yeah. But yeah, both sides. So we have, so we invest in mobile home parks. They cash flow very well. Uh, so if you're a cash flow investor, you want more money back or a raw high cash on cash return uh, without all the headaches because there's sponsors or operators where you do the, all the work, then that's great. It's a great way to have something that pays the bills versus a 401k or stocks where you're not getting any cash flow you're you want you know those things to compound and grow that way and then we you know other investors who aren't so concerned about cash flow and they're or aren't concerned at all about cash flow and they want more development projects where you put your money in and you get nothing out for two years or three years while it goes through all the work and everything and then at the end there's a big pop at the end and you pay taxes um I don't like taxes, so I don't really like those plans, but, <laughs> you know, or you don't want to pay taxes. So you do a fund where it's 20 years long and your money goes in and your money comes back to you. And it's just a return of capital and you don't ever really pay taxes or have an increased tax burden for 20 years. And at cash flows, that's a great opportunity too. But most people think, oh, I've heard of this thing called velocity of money. My money needs to move a lot, really fast. So I need to keep moving it. And so I don't want to do long-term deals. I want to do short-term deals. And I love paying taxes. I'm like, okay, that's a narrative around money, the velocity of money. And if you want to just keep moving around, you're going to pay taxes because every capital event requires taxes. Every time you sell your stocks, you're paying taxes, unless you lost money, but you're paying taxes. So we try to avoid capital events um, mm -hmm. because I know how to do more of my money than this, you know, government does. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to keep it. Well, yeah. And, and I think taxes is also just misunderstood or ignored too. Yeah. I mean, especially, I mean, I don't know if you've ever talked to someone that, you know, is paid on a W-2 and they're like, well, I get money back. And I'm like, no, you're, it's, you're not getting money. <laughs> they're not yeah. giving you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're holding. They're holding extra. They're holding extra. You know, so converse. That's that's a good conversation yeah. to have. Yeah, it's just a a way to prove to them that they need to give you back some of your money. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you don't prove prove it well enough, then they're just going to keep it. They're not going to voluntarily give your money back because you forgot to apply for the correct deductions. Mm -hmm. You know. It's just, it's a great scheme. I mean, it makes it super difficult for us to figure out how to get the money back. And only the more savvy people understand. Um, it's it's interesting. What is it? 2% of the tax law is about paying taxes and another 98% of the tax law is about how to not pay taxes. 
but we all focus on the first two percent so much and not the rest oh yeah i mean there's and and that's that's the thing about what you know what i do and just in in this field that i i tell it's like i can't i don't get to put uh, you know, things like that onto a monthly statement. Yeah. It's all just kind of, you know, what's in there, what's about, you know, January 1st, December 31st, but it's, it's too bad because if, if you look at these different vehicles that you set up and, you know, over time and the amount of taxes that, you know, they're able to efficiently, you know, strategize around, uh, it, it would, it would increase that number drastically. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would. I, and I hear you, like, I know exactly what, what you're doing. I, a couple of years ago, um, a, a friend of mine said, Hey Sam, you know, I sold some properties. Uh, I need to park that money in a way where I won't have to pay taxes. I said, okay, well you need to invest where you have equity because that's going to give you depreciation. And he's like, well, I don't want to do that. I want to do debt. I'm not comfortable with equity. My, I, it's too risky. So I want to, I want to do it as debt. And I said, well, as debt, you can't get the tax deductions that you want. And so he ignored my advice. He invested with as debt, gave people loans to buy prop properties, or whatever. Uh, the next year, you know, I was talking to him. I was like, hey, so how's how's your tax bill? And he said, it's terrible. I paid three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in taxes this year. Like man, I told you. <laughs> like we could have, not we could have, you know, significantly, if not totally, eliminated your tax burden um, from your sell of prop properties. You could have ten thirty one it, or you could have invested in a way where you got massive tax uh, deductions, depreciation. And um, that's huge. I mean, that's huge. Uh, you know, huge. look, you look at you know that over twenty years. Even if even a one year, you know, strategy year like that, that money over 20 years. Yeah. Terrible. Right. And and what does the government do with it? Right. I mean, it goes into a giant pot and who knows? Nobody knows what happens to it. It just goes away. I don't know. We we write a lot of checks, you know, as a country, and uh it, it's we're just art. It, it I I I would say like as personal or personal households do do everything differently than we are doing as a country with our managing. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, our money. Sure. It would, it would never work. Like it would never work if you just brought it down to like, you know, a regular family. Uh, would, yeah. Yeah. Last little story. So, you know, I'm in the military and every year we have budgets, but it was, Hey, everybody, you have, you know, a million dollars left in the budget and it's July. We need to spend the rest of that money or we'll lose it. And so every year we are actively trying to spend as much as possible um, because the way the budget works, if you don't spend it, they reallocate it to somebody else the next year because they don't think you need it. And so instead of being rewarded for good fiscal responsibility, we're constantly taught terrible money mindset like just a terrible money mindset just figure and, out a way to spend it yeah we just you we would spend all the money we would have meetings like what can we buy <laughs> you know anybody want anything need anything new desk new chairs new whatever wow new equipment and so we would spend you know as a military i'm sure a hundred million dollars or more gets spent the last two months of the fiscal year Wow. Fascinating. So I really enjoyed having you on this pod. Before you go, in the background, you have a picture of a girl with a pink or red dress standing in front of a bull. It looks like it's about to take her out. Why? What is that picture? And why do you have it? Well, so it's inspired by uh, in New York, uh, New York City, the girl facing the bull the big, huge, uh, monument that they have there. And I just, I think it's cool. I, you know, as, as a woman who I've always worked in a male dominated industry, you know, 
it's it just kind of is a is a reminder to stand up straight sit at the table be part of the game you know so it's somewhat somewhat of an inspiring picture for me that's wonderful i love it i love um i love the underdog story i wish there was more women in finance partic particularly commercial real estate it's terrible it's just a white male dominated world because it's you know the haves the families of past hundred generations if that's who they largely have been and most of us that know anything about commercial real estate how to get into it um, or become financial planners or these other things and it's just it's wonderful to see you have such great success to write a book to teach people to help them because I know you had to get through a lot of your own money narratives to get there. Mm -hmm. um, I did rural Oklahoma to where we are now and where we're going. It's just completely, completely different mindset. Like we had to change that. I think differently. We had to become something better and rise above the poverty mindset. Mm hmm and it, yeah, and it sounds like you've done an amazing job and it's not easy, but it, you know, if we can do that, anyone can do it in my mind, you know, it's just, yeah. it's a decision. It does, you know, change, change doesn't happen overnight and you have to have, you know, a good team around you and people that you, you know, trust that are really good at what they do. So if somebody wants to work with you. Um, because they they like who you are and they feel like they can trust you. And because you have that team that's going to be there to help them and advise them and help them get past the things that are blocking them from progressing. How, how do they how do they find you? How do they reach out to you, Amy? Uh, so they can go to uh, the website and I know that we have a page for our for our our uh, podcast here today it's maven lane financial group.com forward slash clean money wonderful we'll put that in the the uh, notes on the on the page and uh can they find your information there so that they can reach out to you yep uh i yep i they can schedule consultation i've got different uh financial planning packages on the site uh, to, to take a look at. So there's, there's a lot, you know, of information on the site and then, and then we can schedule time to talk and the book, uh, has its own website, which is just your money narrative.com. And there's free checklists there, uh, uh, some free, some that you can buy that are helpful guides for different stages or different things that you might be going through. Uh, job change, divorce, just getting started, and um, they're really, really. I think they're they're they've been really helpful for a lot of people. So um, hopefully, people will check it out. Yeah, absolutely, they should. This is the number one thing keeping you from being successful. If you're listening to this, I'm yes, I'm speaking to you. It, the number one thing keeping you from becoming who you want to be is your mindset. That's it. It's how we look at things. It's how we treat things. Because if not, we'll just keep doing the same things we've always been doing and keep getting the same results. Um, we have to change here. Um, and then we have to take action based off of that change. And if you do, and you work with somebody like Amy Cook, your life will change, mm -hmm. right? Your life will change. And I'm sure I, we probably could have talked about that for an hour of how many people's lives you've seen change, Amy, because they came they worked with you they changed their money narrative and they're on a completely different trajectory um with a completely different destination than they thought possible for sure i mean it, it's anyone can make changes it's just you know committing to the process and and it's not going to ruin your life you're actually going to be feeling better and better it's not overnight it's steps different stages and and we 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 grow as we go and and uh, give ourselves a little grace like Sam and I were talking about 
But Sam, I really appreciate you having me on your show. It was a lot of fun talking with you and uh, hopefully we can connect again and uh, down the road here on another one. Yeah, absolutely. Let's got to check back in in a year, see if you've read your, or written your next book mm -hmm. um, and continue to grow. Amy, thank you so much for joining the call, folks. Please reach out and uh, check out yourmoneynarrative.com or mavenlanefinancialgroup.com backslash clean money so that you can connect with Amy and see what money narratives you need to change so you can get on the right trajectory. And folks, if you haven't already learned, please leverage other people's expertise, their experience, their mindset, so that you don't have to do some of the dumb things that I did in the old days because I didn't leverage other people's experience, money, and mindset. So thank you, Amy. Any last words for the group? No, just, uh, you know, good luck to everyone listening with your continued journey because it is a journey and uh, we all screw up, we get up, we move on and, uh, you know, keep moving forward. So thanks again, Sam, for having me on the show. And uh, I appreciate it. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amy. Uh, and until next time. Sounds good. Thank you for tuning in to Clean Money, where we talk about sustainable investing that improves society. We are passionate about creating great investment returns to investors who want to use their money to make a positive social impact in the world. If you enjoyed the episode, we'd appreciate a five-star review. And if you are interested in making your investing matter, please connect with us at wildmountaincapital.com. Or you can find me, Samuel Sells, on LinkedIn, on Twitter at Sells underscore Samuel, on Instagram at Clean Money Sam, or on Facebook. And finally, make your investing matter.